We're getting a debrief on the World Economic Forum. Rebel News reporter Lewis Brackpool joins me tonight. I'm Sheila Gunn-Reed, and you're watching The Gun Show. The annual meeting of the globalist cabal coven just wrapped up in Davos, Switzerland. Yes, I'm talking about the World Economic Forum. And though the mainstream media and certain politicians say that the motives of the World Economic Forum are completely benign, benevolent, they just want the best for the world. When you dig a little deeper and you listen to what the World Economic Forum leaders and participants are saying about their plans for humanity and the economy and to combat climate change and deal with inequity. It sounds pretty sinister. It sounds like you'll own nothing and be happy. And if you're not happy, well, you better shut up about it. Anyway, Rebel News sent a team of six reporters to Davos, Switzerland to tell the other side of the story because you could not trust the mainstream media to tell the truth because so many of them were participating in the World Economic Forum events. Joining me tonight for a debrief about the sights, the sounds, and all the news from on the ground in Davos, Switzerland is Rebel News reporter Louis Brackpool, and he joins me in an interview we recorded yesterday afternoon. So joining me now from his home in Yapton is my friend and colleague Louis Brackpool. Louis, I wanted to have you on the show because I didn't get to go to Davos. There were some work-related tasks that I needed to deal with back home here, including the continued crackdown on the churches here. But you were not just my eyes and ears on the ground there, but I think you were the eyes and ears of the world on the ground because I think there have never really been any skeptical journalists attending the World Economic Forum meetings. And you could tell um, in some of the coverage from the other media outlets about the fact that there were these foreign invaders um, full of skepticism and doubt in amongst their midst. Um, I guess my first question is, what was it like? Like, what were, did you have any experiences with the other media while you were there? Um, it's, a, it's a good question. I tell you what, you're, you're completely right when you say that they were petrified or they were scared when they realized that they had independent media or journalists and reporters flocking to ask them questions. Um, that being said, of course, you can you can obviously you've seen the clips of Avi Yamini really homing in on a lot of the journalists and the, uh, the other mainstream media outlets such as The New York Times um, and, of course, ministers uh, from all over the world. Um, it's a very, very strange place um, because you have this fake pop up corporate strip in Davos that they obviously do once the annual meetings begin uh, each time that they set it up. And it's just this one big circle jerk. I always explain it. Right. The best way to explain it to someone is, you know, when you go on like, on, on like a hen do or a stag do or you, you're going away with your girlfriends or your, your, um, the lads on a holiday, and you go to those specific types of holidays where there's a main strip of all the bars, clubs, and you know the nightlife and everything. Imagine that, but it's for billionaires, and it's for the corporate lot. And instead of the nightlife, it's more sort of corporations, all funded, all kind of tied in with each other, and they're all just basically doing one big show off, one big circle jerk to say, hey, I'm part of the WEF. Um, all of our companies are in this one conglomerate area uh, and just one big show off, really. And that was really strange. And you saw, of course, clips when I was confronting the Intel events manager. Um, and he, of course, cowardly ran off after i started talking about censorship but after that we panned the camera around you saw 
this celebrity like culture in front of billboards um, of like Intel and the World Economic Forum logo. And that's really weird to me. Uh, you know, obviously, I, I live in the middle of nowhere here in England. Um, so I don't really see that type of celebrity esque type culture. But to see it firsthand in Davos, where the global elite meet and sort of discuss rearranging the world, and that's not a conspiracy theory anymore, you can actually say that out loud. Um, that's really weird to me. So I was pretty weirded out. And I'm be honest, as much as I loved Switzerland and, you know, the mountains and, you know, the, the wildlife and the way it looked, I'm kind of glad I'm back home to my uh, home comforts. Yeah, you know from watching your footage it it felt as though they managed to somehow strip all the charm out of this swiss town yeah and sort of turn it into a billionaire's vegas with yeah. um all these bizarre disposable storefronts i thought that was interesting too is you know and i've seen this at the un climate change conferences where Everything is sort of built once. It's plastic. It's disposable. They build it for show for the world and then just throw it in the bin when they're done. Um, and yeah. I think, you know, same thing at Davos where they're preening about climate change and how these billionaires and these oligarchs and these businesses are going to be the solution for climate change. And yet they're mm -hmm. all flying in on private jets to their little disposable storefronts to lecture us about our SUVs and our climate footprints. Um and you guys noticed a lot of that. You guys went to the airport yeah. and, and showed all the private jets. And what I loved about that was the other media could have gone to the airport. The other media yeah. probably even came in on that airport, but they yeah. didn't think there was anything strange about it. Um, no. It's strange about all these private jets and these billionaires coming in on their uh, private jets and then taking a helicopter actually <laughs> to Davos. They didn't think there was anything strange about that when, uh, you know, it's all just the ends justifying the means. Yeah. And what's interesting about the, the private airport report um, was when we arrived there, the air traffic controllers were so friendly and they actually invited us in. And we were having a great chat with them and they actually showed us the database of all the, uh, all the private um, airplanes going in. And you could easily Google the registration number and figure out who was who. So they were explaining as well how today wasn't a busy day. And of course, there was only I think we saw about four, maybe five private jets on that particular day we were reporting. But the day before and the day before that, they were explaining how it was completely chocker. Essentially, it was completely ran full of private jets. And because I mean, bless them. Unfortunately, they couldn't do the private helicopter uh, transport over to Davos. They had to go via car. Oh, so, oh. you know, poor them, of course, you know, taking the windy roads that we had to into Davos. But um, I think, yeah, you're right. It is important. And I think it, you're right when you say the media could have easily gone there and reported on it and could have explained themselves on, on why. But they don't. Um, because they know it's hypocritical. They know that um, it's wrong. And they don't like the fact that independent journalists or independent reporters point that out because it completely derails their their narrative. Yeah. And there's I think it's more than that. It's not that they share a similar narrative. They share a similar organization as in the exact same one um, of the World Economic Forum. Uh, Avi yeah. Amini ran into the managing editor of the New York Times there. Um, and uh, uh, Sophie Corcoran, who was also on the trip with us, she, I think it was the Wall Street Journal, had uh, uh, an event there. They had their own little sort of pop-up shop storefront pavilion, I guess I'll call it. And yet, so they're attending the World Economic Forum as attendees, organization attendees, but also telling the world without divulging these very obvious conflicts, they're reporting on the event that they are actively participating in. And they don't think there's anything weird about that. They don't think the world deserves to know about these conflicts of interest. And they actually didn't think anyone would tell the world either until you guys went there. Exactly. And, and the main question that I was asking was, how how can you trust? And I think Avi was saying the same thing when he asked the New York Times 
um, chief editor. Um, how can you trust the mainstream media to be fair in their reporting when they're an invited guest? They're invited to these summits by the WEF that espouse all this nonsensical elitist type policy and mentality. How can they be fair in reporting it when <laughs> they're accredited? They're, they're told, yeah, of course, you can come along. You want to take the private jet over to, to, um, to the little private airport we got near Davos? Yeah, sure. Come along. No problem. Whereas, you know, people like us, you know, there's nothing wrong with EasyJet, in my opinion. But, of course, going economy class, getting, um, of course, getting a permit for driving, driving all the way through the, the windy roads and staying in an Airbnb an hour and a half away to, you know, keep going and reporting on what they're saying and what they're doing and what they're up to. I don't know. It's just I don't I don't get how you can you you can trust an organisation or an, a a media outlet who is who is completely accredited and then wants to try and report it fairly. That to me just doesn't make sense. If you want to be fair, don't go around you know pushing this narrative of of net zero and climate change and climate alarmism to then. <laughs> to then turn up to the billionaires boys club and start to espouse the same thing that they are espousing it doesn't it doesn't make sense to me you know they think the public is stupid i think that's the part yeah. that i find the most offensive is they think the public is stupid and if you catch yeah. them lying to the public then they accuse you of misinformation yeah of course yeah and you know you all you got to do is just repeat what klaus schwab is saying what um Harari is saying what all of these um, uh, elitist dudes and girls are, are, are espousing. You just repeat back to to the public, and they'll call you a conspiracy theorist. And I, I don't understand that. Like, how have we gotten to that? That if you're repeating what they are saying to, let's say, the public or a mainstream media outlet, and you're reporting on that, no, you're you're a conspiracy theorist. You're far right. You're um, you're a climate denier, you're X, Y, and Z, for even questioning. It's just, it's mad to me. I, ju I just don't really understand it. Now, you also caused a minor, minor international incident. You got in a fight with the uh, government of Rwanda simply <laughs> for... <laughs> Simply for f citing DW, they accused you of being racist for mm. citing another news source about yeah. what Rwanda was doing regarding vaccinations. Why don't you tell us about that? Yeah, so a panel was created for the WEF called uh, Preparing for the Next Pandemic. And on this panel had a variety of people, including Mr. Bill Gates, who is, of course, so trustworthy. Um, you had various other, uh, Helen Clark, the ex-New Zealand Prime Minister, and Paul Kagame, who is the Prime Minister or the President of Rwanda, all there on this panel talking about preparing for the next pandemic. And you can only do a bit of research into these cats and figure out that they don't have a great track record, especially with Paul Kagame, who, according to DW, which was the, the source that I cited, that back in, I believe, January this year um, of 2022, the rural areas of, of Rwanda had reports from the locals explaining that they were being forced the vaccine upon them by the military and the police. Now, of course, it's difficult, I can imagine, for DW to really verify it because, of course, the <laughs> the police in Rwanda and the, the military in Rwanda are not going to turn around and say yes, of course. And the regime in Rwanda are not going to turn around and say, actually, yes, we were forcing people to to, you know, vaccinate uh, rural citizens. So by citing this source upset the spokesman or spokesperson of the Rwandan government, uh, I believe her name is Yolande Makolo, and she quote tweeted my report and said that it is racist <laughs> and BS um, and basically spouting misinformation and that Rwandans had to wait for so long to get these miracle vaccines, basically. Um, and 
yeah, that that upset them so much, even though that I quoted DW and I showed them the report and said, so how is it? Why is it racist now that I'm saying it? But a local Rwandan reporting on it isn't or, you know, they're just they're disregarding it as either misinformation or just disregarding it at all. But yet I'm now suddenly racist for, of course, pointing that out once again. I don't know. Cognitive dissonance. I don't know what it is. Yeah, and just for our, I guess, our, for our Canadian viewers who might not know who or what DW is, it's the German CBC. It's the German BBC. It's their state broadcaster. So yeah. according to the internets and social media platforms and big tech, this would be a reliable, trusted news source. Take that with a grain of salt, as you should yeah. with all state broadcasters. But... Um, that's who you were quoting here and uh, call me old fashioned, but I think an argument that you were making was maybe we shouldn't be forced vaccinating rural Rwandans. I don't think that's what the position a uh, racist white supremacist would take. Well, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And I don't know how, um, this spokesperson pinned it on race, out of <laughs> everything, out of everything we could have been talking about. She pinned it on skin color which is unbelievably grotesque and um, distasteful to say the least. So, yeah, I don't know. I think, I think I've made my point. Um, I don't think they're going to take my point. And they've already had uh, their state journalists retweet her, um, <laughs> her comments saying that it's racist and BS. So I don't think I'm going to win the hearts and minds of, of that regime personally yeah. so it's kind of a lost cause in my eyes but you know it is what it is i've made my point um he has paul kagami has massive ties with bill gates they both wrote an opinion piece together about um vaccinating africa so i've made my point take it take it as you will um rwanda so you know it's just got to move on from it now from what I saw about the World Economic Forum, it was very anti-Russia. And again, whatever, take that what you will. I'm not getting into that. But mm. uh, it seems as though the frequently the Chinese regime is welcomed with open arms. And more notably, I think this year, the Saudi Arabian regime was giving out ice cream. <laughs> they were encouraging tourism. Um, yeah. They were sort of uh, trying to unload this charm offensive on the billionaires and oligarchs of the world. And I thought, okay, well, you know, whatever you feel about you, th whatever people think Russia's doing, mm. pretty sure the Chinese are committing genocide and try being anything but Saudi Arabian in Saudi Arabia. I mean, we've got indentured servitude, which is just modern slavery, um, religious yeah. police, um, yeah. pesky women like me, we wouldn't get too far in <laughs> Saudi Arabia. So, but those human rights violations everybody sort of glosses over those oh yeah but they were really outspoken against russia and i thought well that's pretty hypocritical but i guess you know those other two countries they got a lot of this right now yeah well that's 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 literally it i mean xi jinping i believe even um made a statement at the wef this year i believe mm -hmm. uh, Obviously, we, we wasn't allowed in, so I couldn't, of course, <laughs> completely verify that. But apparently he made a statement. Uh, Zelensky took time out of the war to, uh, of course, make a statement as well, which was very fascinating. Um, and, of course, like you mentioned, Saudi Arabia, and they had their own cafe where you could go and explore the, uh, the, the, the coffees or the whatever of the Saudi people. And I made the statement saying, well, let's not talk about the human rights abuses over the years. Because, of course, people seem to just forget about these types of things. Um, but, yeah, they, they had a Russian war crimes, they called it, uh, pop up. I don't know. It was it was painted basically by activists. It was originally the Russian house. Um, and then activists changed it to the Russian war crimes house, where, of course, um, you can go in and it flashes up images, brutal images of, of course, the invasion. Um but, you know, <laughs> it's just it's one of them things, isn't it? It's a, it's a touchy, touchy subject. You had Ukrainians uh, protesting there, talking about, you know, how we should how Europeans should cut off their gas um, and, you know, electricity to, of course, 
you know, <laughs> hurt the Putin regime um, because I didn't realize that, of course, turning down your air conditioning in your car and, of course, showering at least once a week hurts Putin's war machine. But to add to that, you ask you ask these activists, well, what have you done to contribute? What have you done to, of course, um, contribute towards this type of activism? And they haven't. They want you to do yeah. it. That's yeah. the problem. This is the problem. This man mentality. There's no practice what you preach anymore. So there's a lot of hypocrisy in that Russia um, war crimes display. And, you know, trying to get them to condemn forces such as the Azov battalion. I mean, that's difficult in itself. Yeah. So, yeah, there's a lot of hypocrisy. There's a lot of uh, loose ends with it. So, yeah, it's a subject that you just have to tread carefully, I guess, especially being in Davos and seeing it. <laughs> yeah, I think on what might have been your first day there when the team sort of encountered those Antifa activists who were yeah. protesting the World Economic Forum. And I'm like, wait, am I am I getting along with Antifa at this moment? But yeah. then they started talking and I was like, no, I'm not. Um, <laughs> because they saw the war in Russia or the war, Russian war in Ukraine, rather, as this opportunity to uh, grasp at green energy and uh, yeah. which is insane because the Ukraine yes. or Ukraine is going to need a lot of fossil fuels to rebuild itself if and when the war ever ends. Uh, but secondarily, um, the answer to getting Western Europe off of Russian gas, if that's the goal here, and I'm happy to help with that because the answer is not green energy that's reliable and needs fossil fuel backup. It's just fossil fuels from friendly regimes like Canada, but they never get that far in their thinking. They think, you know what's going to help? Wind turbines. <laughs> that's the answer. That's the answer to world peace, wind turbines. Yeah, exactly. And uh, of course, there was talk of the sanctions as well by the activists and that they want more money uh, into Ukraine and they want more uh, humanitarian aid, even though, of course, Biden has pledged 44 billion, I believe, dollars. Yeah. And our um, <clears throat> the, the Johnson um, <clears throat> uh, administration, they've pledged, I think, one point three billion pounds um, from us. So I don't know. It, it's kind of like, a, well, it's it's a difficult one because I, I understand the mentality that they, they, they fled this you know, brutal. Well, both are brutal in my eyes, Ukraine and Russia. It's a war. Israeli it's a war. <laughs> it's exactly, a war. Exactly. So, you know, they fled this. So and they 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 have this mentality of they, they want their people to be, you know, helped or saved or, you know, whatever that is. The problem is there's no outward thinking. There's no broad perspective of it. You know, sanctions don't hurt oligarchs. They don't right. hurt politicians. They hurt ordinary people. Yeah. And this is yeah. what people fail to understand. The sanctions are going to be obviously hurting us. And it's going to be hurting, of course, ordinary Russian people as well that have been caught up in the mess and that don't support the war. So, yeah, it's it's a very, very difficult subject to have. And seeing it in Davos as well was quite a, an extraordinary experience because I was not expecting Antifa nor Ukrainian activists to be in the center of uh, where the, the global elitists hang out. You know, I'm not, I'm not even I'm not even sure if I'm against sanctions, but they're just bringing these things like a shotgun against the wall. Like they're banning Latvian vodka because of someone of Russian yeah. descent owns the company. Oh. And simultaneously, these are the same people who say, the American government should stop the sanctions on Cuba. Yeah. Or, you know, while advocating for sanctions against Russian civilians, as opposed to the Cuban government, um, yeah. it, they, they have to pick a lane now. Um, yeah. it's, you're a very busy guy. I hope so because you work for us and this is the middle of a work day. Um, it's a trick question. Um, but, uh, you have also done <laughs> some very important work with, um, Kian Simone on uh, exposing the Great Reset um, because it's one thing to go to Davos um, and, you know, be at the World Economic Forum, but it's another thing to truly understand why we should be skeptical, 
wary and against many of the things that they're talking about there. And you've sort of dug down and done the investigative work a little bit deeper. So why don't you tell us about that? Sure. Um, myself and Kian Simone have, have created, written, and of course, Kian has done fantastic work on editing and obviously producing the work. But we've started a docu-series about the Great Reset and basically giving the viewer um, complete overhaul of information in video format. And it's it's been difficult because there's so much information to take in and there is so much about the Great Reset. It's not just it's not a simple subject that you can just say in a sentence. There are so many layers to it. These so people what, have thought of everything. They have oh, literally absolutely. thought of how to meddle in every aspect of the world. Correct. And it's it's scary to be yeah. to put it bluntly, it's scary. Um so we decided, we got together and said, let's do a docu-series about this subject because there's so much information. We can put it into video format and make it digestible for people to, of course, come on board with Rebel and watch and learn, basically. And there's a lot of information people might know previously if they're already into the subject, but there's a lot of new information that we found along the way. So what we've done is we've just released episode one which is an introduction to the great reset to give the viewer a basic understanding and an idea of what the world economic forum is who is klaus schwab what is this covid19 the great reset book and their associates and what's part of it and what's next and we've decided with this docuseries on the direction We've decided to break down each episode into resets exactly the same as how Klaus Schwab has done in his book, where we've split it into categories. So the next episode is all about the technological reset. And then obviously others will be environmental reset, societal reset, geopolitical reset and so on. And this is going to be themed in each episode and we're going to really hammer down the information the people who are involved and how to basically resist it and it's a fun project it's also a very depressing yeah. <laughs> project but it's an important one because people need to know and understand that this isn't a conspiracy theory this is fact this is going on and it's already in place and people need to wise up and really start talking about it if you haven't done already and uh, people can find that at exposetheresets.com. Yes. They can support your work there. But what I really liked about the first episode is that there's, and it's difficult for people like you and me to hmm. limit our own personal opinions into things. Yes. You didn't actually do a lot of that. You, And I think that's important because yeah. you just really showed this is what they're saying that you don't, don't yeah. take my word for it. This is what they're saying they want to do. Um, and yeah. there wasn't a lot of opinion there. And I'm sure I, I think further along down the line, there may be some opinion. I'm not opposed to that, but as an introduction, uh, I thought that was great because it sort of takes away that argument that people have like, Oh, you're misinterpreting them. Oh, this is a conspiracy theory. And you just say, no, this is what they're saying. Don't trust me. Listen to them. Yes, I think we set a few rules in a way we wanted to conduct the work. We didn't want to use particular language um, being one of them because it's very easy to use the language that that would put the everyday listener off, basically, yeah. because we want as many people to try and understand this as possible and to not be scared off by it um, because it's easy to say buzzwords like, new world order or um just a theory or you know x y and z or depopulation and all of these words but it's so important to hammer in the information um in a way that is accepted by all so the best way or the best conclusion we've come up with in order to give that information to the viewer is literally repeating exactly what they say and limit opinions to such a, a very minimal level so yeah it's 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 mad how you can get that across to people without giving your opinion basically at all because they're saying it 
it, yeah. you know, it's got nothing to do with me. It's got nothing to do with yourself, Sheila, or anyone else that's tackling the subject. It's all to do with them and what they are saying. And when you realize that, hang on a minute, this is what they're saying. This isn't something that we're just pulling out of thin air or interpreting in a different way. It's exactly what they are saying and implementing is the information that counts. Well, and unlike the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times, we don't think people are stupid who are watching our stuff. We know that if we give them the information, they can make their own minds up and they'll likely come to the same conclusions about this sinister organization that we exactly. have. Uh, Lewis, thanks so much for coming on the show. I cannot wait to see episode two of Expose the Reset. I'm waiting with bated breath. Um, and really, as a journalist, I can't wait to see what you do next. Oh, thanks, Sheila. Thanks for having me on. It's really good to see you. Hey, we'll talk soon. For those of you who want to see all of Lewis and the rest of the team's reports from on the ground in Davos, Switzerland, you can visit wefreports.com. And if you'd like to make a donation to offset the cost of sending six journalists to Davos, Switzerland, to bring you the other side of the story. You can do that at the same website, wefreports.com. Now, this is the portion of the show where I read a letter or comment from a viewer. And if you want to send a letter directly to me, just send it to Sheila at rebelnews.com and just put gun show letters in the subject line, which makes it easy for me to search and find because... I get hundreds of emails a day. So a little help with that would be really appreciated. Now, today's comment actually comes to us by way of Rumble. And it's a comment on the live stream uh, from Tuesday that's hosted by myself and David Menzies. And on the live stream, we were talking about Trudeau's freeze. It's a ban, really, on the sale and importation of handguns in Canada, which strands the assets of potentially 2.1 million Canadians who are firearms owners. And it does nothing to address the problem with illegal guns coming into the country and continuing to be used in uh, crimes in Canada's large cities by gangs and fentanyl traffickers. Instead, this focuses the ire of the law on people who are already complying with the law, and that is lawful Canadian gun owners who have an RPAL, because that's the level of licensing that you need to be in possession of a handgun in the first place. And you can't even use your handgun at home. You have to take it to the range. So already the highest regulated <laughs> kind of uh, firearm in the country and the liberals say, you know what we need to do? Make sure you don't even have it. And that'll solve the gang problems. Anyway, We've got a comment here on the live stream from yesterday, and it comes from Coho Slayer 1027, who says, wrap your head around this. Trudeau is reaching right into your pocket and using your tax dollars found there to use on multi-layered firearms legislations to disarm and seize your guns. And then he reaches into your left pocket and uses the tax dollars found there to send weapons and munitions to Ukrainians to support a war you were never given to support or not. Now, I think this is an interesting point because wherever you fall down on the war in Ukraine, any reasonable person can see the benefit of a well-armed, well-trained civilian populace. At the beginning of the Russian incursion into Ukraine, civilians were lined up at police stations to get firearms so that they could defend their land against Russian invasion. That's the benefit of a well-trained, well-armed populace. And yet, here in Canada, Justin Trudeau has decided to deal with gangsters, gangbangers, fentanyl traffickers, by coming after sports shooters. And for context, sports shooters in Canada were quiet about it because we're constantly subject to confiscations and seizures and reclassifications. So, you know, you, you don't like to boast about the kinds of firearms that you have or even that you're a firearms owner at all. However, the sports shooting industry, it's actually bigger than organized hockey in Canada. I think the numbers are 2.1 million Canadians are involved in the 
shooting sports, they're licensed Canadian gun owners, 2.1 million. I think it's 1.2 million Canadians that are playing organized hockey every single year. So firearms are more Canadian than hockey sticks, but leave it to Justin Trudeau in his Laurentian bubble to not know anything about what Canada's like outside of where he lives and the people he talks to. Well, everybody, that's the show for tonight. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'll see everybody back here in the same time, in the same place next week. And remember, don't let the government tell you that you've had too much to think. <laughs>